Thousands of refugees are fleeing war, hunger, and poverty, hoping to reach Europe via Libya. And there were still multiple, multiple departures. They crossed the Mediterranean Sea in flimsy, overcrowded boats without life vests. Prepare me for a jacket for children. And are rescued by volunteers like these. It's early morning as the ocean Viking leaves Marseille. Aboard are 23 volunteers from SOS Mediterranean and Doctors Without Borders. They've been on many rescue missions before. They've leased the 70 meter long ocean Viking. Running the rescue operation costs 14,000 euros each day. The volunteers rely exclusively on donations. Nicholas, or Nick, Romaniuk heads the operation. The 35-year-old plots the ship's course. Other volunteers assist by checking news and weather reports and tracking other ships. Nick's number one priority, to save as many lives as possible. Proceeding uh, south uh, and keeping a sharp lookout for other, uh, other potential boats in distress in the area. Uh, and just monitoring uh, our radar, uh, VHF uh, communications or waiting for distress alerts from either, either the authorities uh, or from, uh, from, from anyone already. Refugee boats rarely show up on the ship's radar because they're too small. So the crew keep a lookout, scanning the horizon. Often, traffickers deliberately misinform refugees. What we've heard over the years is that the instructions that people are given uh, on, on the boats is to, is to proceed north and from the coast you can see the oil platforms. There's, um, they have the, the flares uh, burning off the, uh, the excess gas and so those flares are visible from the, uh, from the, uh, from the land and so you can see um, a haze and the sad thing about it is they, uh, they actually tell people that that is Italy. So they say within a, in a couple of hours you'll be, you'll be arriving in Italy. The, the reality is it's, it's not the case at all. Frenchman Tongi is one of the most experienced volunteers on the team. He's saved thousands of lives at sea already. We put a lot of effort in what we call crowd control, which, which is just about taking control of people's mind and bring them to follow our instruction carefully and closely <clears throat> and to consider that the best option is to trust us. Several hours later, 130 kilometers off the Libyan coast, they suddenly receive a distress call. Alarm phone, a network that monitors the Mediterranean, has alerted the rescuers. Nick needs to know where to steer his ship. We have an alert for a possible wooden boat with 9-0 packs on board. Uh, I was wondering if you have a visual. Stop by. Stand by, we'll fall. The volunteers have made radio contact with a plane operated by the European border agency, Frontex. They've got eyes on the refugee boat in distress. They launch the speedboat. With 230 horsepower, they race over the choppy waves. They ready the life vests to make sure everyone is safe. They need to ensure all refugees, among them women and children, remain calm, even though they're desperate to get off the tiny boat. Uh, evaluation is uh, everything looks stable on board. Uh, there are people standing. Okay, copy. We're gonna slowly approach carefully, and if we need anything, we're gonna take it inside. It's gonna be. Order. Yeah, Roger. 
The engine is stopped. The engine is stopped. There is no water coming out. Okay. So, can you come? Bounce well. 90 degrees. Okay. Nick can only watch from afar. Now everything is in Tongi's hands. Will the refugees listen to him and stay calm? Many can't swim, and Tangi hasn't handed out life jackets yet. They could drown if their boat capsizes. Tangi has the situation under control. He's experienced and has been on many rescue missions before. Prepare me for life jacket for children. Not baby, children. I need you to stay silent. Capito? The boats must not touch, as the flimsy, overcrowded refugee boat could easily capsize. Then the actual rescue begins. First, five infants are taken aboard, then everyone else, one by one. Then, the speedboat returns to the Ocean Viking, shuttling back and forth until everyone is safe. Now the Doctors Without Borders staff tend to the rescued. They swap their wet, gas-drenched clothes for clean, dry garments. Men and women are allocated separate spaces on board where they can rest. You all received a rescue kit. Inside of it, there's high-energy food, water, clothes, and a blanket. The rescued are briefed in English, French, Arabic, and other languages. A team of doctors checks in with every person. Then they receive the next distress call. Over the past 30 hours, the team will embark on three rescue missions. They saved the lives of 276 refugees. The volunteers worked nonstop. The people are quite exhausted. Some of them found it quite difficult to climb onto the boats and to climb up onto ocean biking, but otherwise, luckily, they seem like the health condition is good. 65 of those rescued are under the age of 18. Many are unaccompanied. Most are from Mali, Nigeria, Bangladesh, and Morocco. Twenty-four-year-old Michael is from Ghana. We, we almost sink. Because our boat was very, very small. And the moment we trying to remove the water from this boat, the boat started sinking. But we thank God that we made the ocean vacancy. They took us out of the boat. They saved our life. We thank God and we thank them too. Michael, like so many others, got stranded in Libya because of the war. Returning to Ghana through the Sahara was unthinkable. So the only option left was to try to make it across the Mediterranean Sea. It's not easy, but we are suffering from Libyans. The way they are treating us, well, treated us, sometimes they will catch you, they put money on you. Until you find money to pay them, they will not leave you. With almost 300 refugees aboard, the Ocean Viking is at overcapacity. With Nick's approval, the volunteers improvise, creating extra space for the rescued. Because it's going to rain and we've got 270 people on board who can't be protected, so we've only got a little bit of shelter here. And this, this container, we emptied it in advance, but then we had three rescues and we didn't have time to prepare it. Now we've got a little bit of quiet. There are warm meals every morning and midday, and as much drinking water as anyone wants. Most of those rescued hadn't brought any with them. <laughs> At 
At the back of the ship, everyone can wash their clothes. The captain's told me our water level is a bit low, so I'm going to have to be a bit careful with how much water we use, OK? So if you're waiting, can you come and wait on this side to wash, to wash clothes? Come and wait this side. What can I do for you? What do you need? Say, tell me. I'll call you in. If I had my harmonica, you you could sing. I can sing to myself, yeah. Stephen, are you free? Yeah. Can you take these guys down to the, to the, near the muster station to hang their clothes? Meanwhile, Nick is in negotiation with Italian and Maltese authorities. He wants permission to bring the rescue to safety. He coordinates all his actions with national authorities to avoid being accused of playing into the hands of human traffickers. A few days later... Uh, we have some really good news this morning. Uh, we are going to Italy, to Pozzalo, where you will all disembark. I feel... Uh, I, feel I am happy. I'm very happy. Finally, they get to disembark. But Italian authorities detain the ship at port. One of the refugees is suspected of having contracted the coronavirus. The ocean Viking is quarantined for two weeks. Despite the fact that her help at sea is desperately needed with ever more people risking their lives to reach Europe. I see videos in the central Mediterranean. I see. Uh, videos through, throughout uh, the, the Mediterranean uh, and, and the Atlantic of, of men, women and, and, and children uh, being left in danger, being left potentially to drown, and for me that's not acceptable. That's why Nick wants the Ocean Viking to return as quickly as possible to the Libyan coast. Lives, after all, are at stake. <laughs>